Good evening, everybody. Good evening, Europe. And thanks for joining us today from anywhere in Europe, from anywhere in the world because of the pandemic, obviously online. But this gives hopefully many of you the chance to join us uh, in this birthday party, actually, because New Europeans is celebrating its seventh birthday today. New Europeans, for those of you who don't know it, check it out, first of all. And secondly, a brief introduction. Uh, New Europeans um, is a civil uh, civic organization. Um, that champions uh, European citizenship um, and European citizen rights and that wants to strengthen European civil society. And we are a network of citizens based uh, all the, over the continent from Portugal um, to Ukraine and um, also any other directions of, of the compass that you can imagine. Um, first, I would like to hand over to Jana de Groot. Uh, Jana de Groot is um, a founding member of We Belong and together with We Belong, we are hosting today's event. Jana. Hello, hello, hello everyone. So I welcome you on behalf of We Belong Europe. I'm very happy to welcome all of you. I'm also very happy that all the panelists uh, took their time to discuss about the future of Europe today. Today is a very important day. I mean, we are celebrating the seventh anniversary of New Europeans. Happy, happy birthday, new Europeans. So yes, we are celebrating this, but we are also commemorating um, the 18th anniversary of the Gaulle's Appel. So yes, we are discussing today about the future of Europe. We are not uh, giving a history class here, but we are learning from the past and moving um, into the future. And so, yes, I'm really thankful that all of you took the time uh, to watch and to be here. And I'm really looking forward to this. And I see you in the next panel. And I will give now the floor to James. Thank you. Thank you, Jana. Um, my name is James Beckles. I am an activist and campaigner and former um, chair of London region for new Europeans. So I welcome you all here. Thank you for turning out tonight. I know um, Europe is a very topical subject for many people. It's an exciting area and tonight we'll be, dis we'll be discussing, as Jana said, um, 80 years since the lapel um, from Charles de Gaulle, for the call to Europe. And today we have our own lapel. So let's uh, make the most of this time. Uh, it's as I said, it's a momentous occasion, it's a conversation, it's about learning, and it's an appeal to us as well to share in our European beliefs, our values, but also discuss how we can make Europe better for all people in the future, and also presently now. So I look forward to having and hearing all these discussions with you, and um, let's get started. Thank you very much, Jana and James. And um, as we heard just now, our birthday coincides with this uh, jubilee of the um, appel, uh, of, of Char Charles, de, um, Ch Charles de Gaulle uh, in French, uh, Charles de Gaulle. Um, and we are now going to hear um, Monique Beltram, um, and we're going to hear her appeal. Um, it's going to be a section of the, of, the, of, the, of the long appeal, which you can uh, find anywhere on the internet. And uh, just a quick note, because Europea Europe is a multilingual place. Um, for those of you who don't understand French, this is absolutely no issue, and there is going to be um, the transcript in the Facebook comments in English, if you want to follow it in English. Um, and this gives you the floor, Monique, for your appel. Monique, c'est à toi oui. maintenant. Les chefs qui, depuis de nombreuses années, sont à la tête des armées françaises ont formé un gouvernement. Ce gouvernement, à l'égard la défaite de nos armées, s'est mis en rapport avec l'ennemi pour cesser le combat. Certes, nous avons été, nous sommes submergés par la force mécanique terrestre et aérienne de l'ennemi. Infiniment plus que le nombre, ce sont les chars, les avions, la tactique des Allemands qui nous font reculer. Ce sont les chars, les avions, la tactique des Allemands qui ont surpris nos chefs au point de les amener là où ils en sont aujourd'hui. Mais le dernier mot est-il dit L'espérance doit-elle disparaître La défaite est-elle définitive? No. Let's focus um, on uh, the call of Europe today and let's go over to, to Olivier Vedrin. Um, Olivier is one of the directors of the organization, one of the directors of New Europeans, um, and is a former protester on the Maidan um, in Kiev, um, which you all obviously remember from the very tumultuous times um, back in the days of, of the protests. 
Um, he's also a former spokesperson of the European Commission for a couple of years, and he's today the chief editor of the Russian Monitor, um, which is um, one of the few, <laughs> I unfortunately have to say, free media in Russia, and um, a strong voice of the opposition in the country. Um, Olivier, um, please share your uh, call to Europe. Merci beaucoup, bonjour. Uh, happy birthday to us, to New Europe. Um, yes, how to speak today with two birthdays, it's very difficult. Now uh, I can start. Uh, I don't want to do a nostalgie. I am not a nostalgic person. Um, the goal is a part of our history. He, he was in the right side against Hitler, and he was for democracy and against totalitarianism. And uh, what we have to, what the heritage of that is that we always have to stand up for the value in which we believe. The goal did that against Hitler, but he was not alone. You have also resistance in Italy. You, you had a, an event uh, with that uh, last week. And from those uh, resistance network, uh, a European, can say European Federation, ID, European construction began. Then the legacy is what? Is we have to stand up for our value. It, this is the future of Europe. We, you can go, you know, in the Mont Valérien uh, in France, where you can see the big Croix de Lorraine, Lorraine Cross, where you have some person from, not only from France, but also from Africa, who are in this uh, crypt of Mont Valérien. And each year you have the president of France who go to the Mont Valérien to commemorate the resistance. Then the legacy is ready to stand up for our value and to be in this way of thinking of the network of the European resistance to build a new Europe uh, on human rights and, um, and democracy against every totalitarianism. Now it's Putin, tomorrow that that's can be another person, for example. Now, this legacy, what is now to stand up? To stand up now is not to wait for a new De Gaulle, you know. Uh, the stand up now for our values it will come from the citizens themselves. Uh, we, have, we need a new governance in Europe um, who include more and more the citizen. In my article for EU Talk, uh, with the newspaper of ENA, uh, the National School of Administration in France, uh, I showed the idea to, 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 to do a new call for the 18th of June for a new governance. This new governance can, can make a counter power for the citizens, for the citizens. Now, I think the legacy of the Appel du 18 Juin 80 years before, this legacy is to us, the citizen, to do a new appel of the 18 Juin, um, to have a new governance who involve more and more the European citizen in our values. That's, that's my message. Thank you very much. Um, that was great. This was um, the call to European citizens to become more active. And this is going to be um, the principal uh, point of basically uh, our next panel and also uh, of this event because we are commemorating, um, uh, not commemorating, we are, we are celebrating uh, the birthday of an organization uh, that cherishes European citizenship and active European yeah. citizenship. Um, and we are uniting people not only from different areas, but also um, I think we have a sound disturbance here, um, so maybe that microphone could be muted. Um, we are celebrating um, today an organization that combines uh, citizens from all over the place um, and from also also different different sectors of society, both professionally um, as well as uh, where they are active in, in their free time. 
Um, and this is why I'm now getting back to uh, Jana, first of all, because she's going to join us on our panel. Um, Jana um, is, as I said before, um, a co-founder of We Belong, and you already got to know her in the, in the immediate session. Um, the second person joining us uh, on the panel you also know, it's James uh, Beckles. He is, as he introduced himself, a local politician in, in London and a former chair um, of, of New Europeans London. Um, the third person joining us today is Maria Laura Franciosi. Um, and uh, Maria Laura Franciosi uh, is also a director of New Europeans, um, just like Olivier, is, as, who we heard just before. Um, and she's also um, a leading editor in the um, ANSA, which, is, which was uh, ANSA, which was uh, rated the most reliable um, media outlet in Italy. Um, and is very much um, knowledgeable in the field of freedom of media, freedom of press. Um, and the fourth person joining us on this panel now um, is Philippe Marquez. Philippe Marquez is a judge from Portugal um, and um, is the president and founder of MEDEL. Um, it's an organization, um, an association of lawyers, um, which is active all over Europe and has different bases all over the continent, and that is fighting for the rule of law. Um, not only, but of course, also in Hungary and Poland. And we might want to um, learn more about the organization's um, objectives and, and activities. And Meta, and I want to point this out because this is quite a substantial oh, figure. Um, 18,000 uh, 18, members, 18,000 lawyers are um, sort of um, joining their efforts um, in, the, in the maintaining of, of the rule of law. Um, so um, I would like to welcome you all to this virtual panel. Um, and I want to um, pick up the, the appeal to, to European citizens uh, that we just heard from um, Olivier. Um, and I would want to go uh, immediately uh, to Jana um, as a young political activist. Um, and I would like to ask her um, how she thinks that European citizens uh, could be activated. Hello again. Um, yes, so yes, I'm a political activist, but I'm also in politics in Luxembourg. I'm also elected on the local level. Uh, and how uh, people can get activated, I mean, with conversations we are having now, clearly, like uh, uh, telling uh, our people that are our friends even that they are concerned, that they are also part of this union, that they also should feel concerned and discuss about uh, issues. So yes, this was your question, right? Uh, Julius, or do you want to know more? Uh, for, me, for me, getting people to be active is just convincing them that they are also concerned. And it's on us to do this. It's on us EU citizens to do this. Great, thanks very much. Um, now for James, uh, you are a local politician uh, and you were leading the, the London branch, so you were um, sort of making that transformation that is very often described from sort of someone who is active in a civil society organization um, and then becomes active in, in politics. Um, and obviously in order to change our lives, um, at the end, politicians need to make decisions. And many people are though very apathetic towards becoming actively uh, involved in politics itself and remain in the civil society uh, organizations field. So uh, how did you experience this, uh, this transformation? Um, and what were obstacles and what kind of points would you say could convince people um, to actually step up how to manage this transformation from being a civil society activist to a politician? James, without further ado, please. Thank you very much. Um, well, civil society um, campaigning is very much a passion and it comes from the heart. Uh, it's often about the issues that we care about most and with New Europeans, it's about bringing people who identify themselves as being European and having European values together. And I always felt that this was a very passionate area for me. Um, I've got friends from university, I've got friends in my personal life who come from various different strands and all, all over Europe and come from very different backgrounds. Um, myself, you know, originally my family come from the Caribbean, but they are uh, resident here in, in the UK. I've been raised here and I've always learned about European values. And this all, and New Europeans was an organization that spoke to those same values that I had and about building that awareness. And often um, from a UK perspective, uh, knowledge about the, about the EU and about, you know, the, the multilingual, multicultural nature of, of the 
of Europe was often missing. And I always felt my role, especially in a, in a big melting pot like London, was to go out there and raise those um, issues. Um, I would say that my transition from being a local campaigner and activist with New Europeans to transitioning into local politics um, was, was seamless, but it wasn't. Often, there, there were often competing um, goals, often in time, in what you have to do. There's compromise, while it, as a civil society campaigner, you have your issue, you stick to it, and you try to get those gains. But there's also parallels. As a local um, office holder, I can raise those issues in a town hall or with a greater audience of people. And I've had the opportunity to campaign on a um, pan-London level um, during the European elections. Didn't quite win, but it was a good, ex good time to, to show those values and to talk about the, um, you know, the challenges of Europe, but also the benefits. In, in terms of the obstacles, I would say that's one of the obstacles, is often people don't often know that they can get involved. Um, you have groups who've come from um, new European states who often aren't willing or able to get involved in, in their host country. So part of what I was doing was trying to encourage them that they can do it, that their rights um, were tied up in, in, in campaigning, in being active in their local communities and encouraging others to do so as well. And convincing people is often hard. It might be a soft convincing that you simply talk to them and try to raise their awareness about the issues that are concerning them. And it could be you know, other more um, in-depth campaigns. So with literature, with um, events, trying to show that these are the benefits of being a European citizen. These are the benefits of having a um, set of institutions that support you and support your views. So I think it's um, it's exciting to be a campaigner, whether it's in a political party or political field or from civil society. I'm still um, with New Europeans now. I still do a lot of events and I see these parallels are there. And I would encourage anyone out there, if you're passionate about a subject and you're passionate about Europe and you're passionate about the EU or or any other part of, you know, whether it's human rights, um, civil liberties and justice, then get involved in any sort of organization, and especially one that speaks to your values and to what um, you hold dear to you. Thanks a lot. You spoke about European citizenship and obviously um, communicating about those issues and also creating that, that sense of Europeanism, um, especially also perhaps with, with people who move from one country to another. Um, I think the media plays a crucial role. And this is where I would like to hand over to Maria, and her experience as a journalist. Um, and I would like to um, learn a bit more about where you see the role of the media and how we can also um, help create that European, um, that Europeanism from, from a media side of view, because obviously civil activists in the street um, speaking to different people, this is sort of a, a process that takes ages and that is taking very long. And the media obviously have much more of, of a levy there. So how, could you, how would you argue that the media could play a role um, in this process? You would need to unmute your microphone, please. Yeah. Thank you very much I, um, for giving me the floor. Um, sorry, because before I just uh, lost the connection, but uh, anyway, now I found it again. Um, for me, uh, Europe uh, means uh, two words, compassion and solidarity. And, uh, and uh, we in the media are trying to push for, for Europe to be to feel uh, really uh, th these two uh, ideas uh, towards one another. Um, we don't want people to be judged for the color of their skin or, or the prestigious school or university they attended, but from their engagement uh, to improve the life of uh, their fellow citizens and from the compassion of the others. And, and this is the, the 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 what I mean this is for me this is what the the media should be doing um, together to study together to be engaged and to feel for the well-being of uh, of the others I mean we are trying I mean I. In my uh, activity now, we're trying to defend the journalists um, uh, who are, have no idea, you know, in, in the normal world of what, what's happening with people who go out 
to do their work, be it the journalists to, to do their work. And uh, particularly, I mean, also during this uh, uh, attack, because uh, people thought that they were kind of spreading the, 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 the COVID. Uh, and and, and, and this, this is one of the, uh, of the many recent cases of, uh, of uh, journalists being so uh, i think we have to uh, think that the value of uh, information is something that we cannot do without and and this is what we are uh, we are fighting for for the freedom of the of the press freedom of the speech and uh, and freedom of information and just uh, now uh, yesterday i started doing a lot of um, tweeting and uh, and the messaging because uh, they've just um, uh, there was a judgment in the Philippines for a, a, a journalist who is the founder Maria Ressa she's the founder of the, uh, a big um, uh, local newspaper and uh, but that goes against the the um, the president of the Philippines, and um, and uh, she's now victimized, and she was she risks uh, six years in prison because of, uh, of um, a word which had been misspelled in the they they, they just tried to find uh, the judges are completely um, dependent on the uh, on the power of the president. And and this is not this is one of the cases and and uh, in Europe the same thing in Europe we have had cases of journalists who have been killed for denouncing for criticizing the the excessive powers of some of some uh, prime ministers or president and so we that, that's, uh, yeah that, that gives a a very good bridge to um, our our next uh, speaker on the panel who is Philippe. Um, a freedom, freedom of press, freedom of, of, of the media and uh, citizens who can also organize themselves in civil society organizations. Yeah. Um, this is a key issue, um, but this is under attack. So, um, Philippe, where is it under attack? How is it under attack? And what are you doing uh, to fight this? Well, uh, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, well, first of all, congratulations to New Europeans on its uh, anniversary. Um, and uh, thank you. And uh, my greetings to all my fellow uh, co-panelists in, in this session. Um, uh, just to correct you, uh, we don't have lawyers in our, uh, Medel is an umbrella organization. Uh, we don't have individual members, we have uh, associations as members. Um, uh, we have right now 23 associations of judges and prosecutors uh, from 16 European countries, uh, EU member states and, uh, and not. Um, well, uh, what everyone has just said goes down to one simple thing, which is uh, rule of law. And this is what Medal has been doing in these, uh, in these years. We, we were founded in 1985, so the European scenario was quite different from the, the current one. Um, uh, our goal is not exclusively rule of law. We tackle issues such as immigration, fundamental rights and freedoms, but it all goes down to rule of law. So um, what we've been witnessing, unfortunately, in recent years is that the rule of law, which is one of the cornerstones, one of the fundamental values of the European Union, is under attack in many places. And uh, what we have been doing in Medel is we've been fighting for the rule of law. Uh, in a certain way, what General de Gaulle uh, has done 80 years ago was uh, an appell saying uh, we have to put aside our differences and we have to go down to what our basic values are. We have to, in his case, to protect and to defend France, regardless of being from one political orientation or the other, we have to unite and to protect France. And what we say is that uh, Medel is obviously a non-partisan organization. What we are appealing is that all European citizens should unite and reaffirm the essentiality of the rule of law. Because only with rule of law and with an independent judiciary, you can freely and completely develop whatever uh, political preference you have. And what you just said about civil society organizations 
goes and fits uh, perfectly in what, for instance, today the European Court of Justice has just done. Today there was a decision of the European Court of Justice upholding uh, uh, the opinion of the European Commission in an infringement procedure, saying that what Hungary did, the laws in Hungary that uh, restricted NGOs with foreign, uh, with foreign funding was contrary to the European Union law. And this is an example of what we should be fighting for. This is the fundamental, uh, one of the fundamental values of the European Union. It's the protection of the rule of law and the independence of the judiciary. That's what we have been doing. That's the fight we've been carrying in Poland, trying to protect the, the judicial system against the organized and orchestrated attack that has been going on for the recent years. And basically, uh, uh, it's not a fight of judges and prosecutors. This is a fight of all citizens. Because when you don't have an independent judiciary where citizens' individual rights can be protected, you don't have a free Europe. And this is what we are, we've been trying to say. So it's the basis of Europe which is at stake here. It's not a question of judges, prosecutors, lawyers, migrants or non-migrants. This is one of the fundamental cornerstones of the European Union, which is being under attack for the recent years. This is what we've been fighting for. And in this day, this is what we appeal <laughs> to the European citizens to do, to join us in this battle. That's what's important right now. Thank you very much. Um, the, the next question goes to, to Jana and, and James in particular um, about activism. Now we heard what's sort of at stake and how important this is, um, but what can you actually do as an activist? What can you do as a member of an organization like New Europeans um, what can you do in order to um, change this prob problem, in order to, to secure the maintenance of the rule of law? Um, what, are your, what are your options at hand? Um, you seem a bit powerless, um, or you might feel you, that you're powerless, uh, but then people like you and obviously organizations like New Europeans are arguing against this. Um, so what can you do? Maybe let's start with James. Uh, thank you, Julius. Uh, I completely agree with everything um, Felipe said, and uh, Maria touched you know, beautifully on um, the, on the freedom of press. Individually, we, we might find it very hard to stand up to um, you know, br brutal regimes or abuses of power, but what New Europeans does very well is bring people who have the same views together so you can coalesce. Uh, you can also have that collective voice and, and shared interests and shared views. And rather than being an individual on your own, trying to stand up to what might be oppressive regimes or difficult situations, you are with a group of people. Like tonight, we've got a fantastic panel. I hope our viewers watching are also people who are interested in um, a free judiciary, a freedom of press, and also the, the ability to go out and campaign and make your voices heard and also touch on the issues which you're passionate about. So I think that's what activism can do. It's about going out there being heard and doing so with people who share your same views. Um, Jana, what have you done, um, and have you have you been campaigning on this issue as well? Um, what what can you do as a as a youth activist um, in terms of in terms of um, maintaining the rule of law? As a youth activist, um, I would say, like if there are people watching or out there that are young that are young and that feel like they want to discuss on issues like the rule of law, uh, you should be interested in checking um, if institutions are organizing events, conferences. The aim is really to come into contact with decision makers and really there make your call to Europe and say what you would like to see and what, what you would like to see that would be changed in the future. Um, and yes, activism is a lot about being passionate about something and really go for it. I see no limits, um, bring people together that share the same ideas as, uh, as James just said, that share the same ideas so your message is strong and then you go where decisions can be made and then you show your ideas and you go for it. And also social media is super powerful nowadays. Uh, as we are doing now, we are connected. Cool. We are connecting because of the internet, because of like Zoom calls, and we are discussing about the future of Europe from our homes. And this is really interesting here. We can really come together in different formats and 
make our voices heard. And I think that also now with this pandemic, and this pandemic especially now showed us that there are many ways how citizens can make their voices heard. So I would say as an activist, you can change a lot. You can change a lot and you can use uh, social media uh, as a tool to make your voice even more, like your voice stronger and your message stronger. So yes, this is my opinion. Great. Um, thanks a lot. And maybe, maybe to conclude this, um, just very briefly uh, from Felipe, obviously this is also a form of activism, but it's a very, it's a very different form of activism. It's not in the streets, it's not uh, campaigning, it's not handing out leaflets um, for something or um, about an idea, um, but you are basically advocating for something and you really need to influence politics and you really need to um, also watch um, what politicians are doing and what kind of bills are put forward, such as um, the one in, in Hungary regarding the um, the alleged um, withdrawal of the of the state of emergency, which then sort of isn't the isn't the withdrawal. So um, how how does your work look like, and what are you doing um, to, to to combat concretely? Well, being a judge, I have to believe in justice. So <laughs> I would say that uh, we are a civil society organization, and um, uh, we've been working uh, like. Uh, in the previous 70 years of the European Union, there's a silent revolution going on. Uh, what I told you about the European Court of Justice's decision of today is uh, one of many decisions the European Court of Justice has uh, given in recent years, and they are truly shaping what Europe could be in the future. Uh, up until two or three years ago, um, States were free, member states were free to do whatever they wanted in their national judicial systems because the organization of national judiciaries was considered a purely internal matter. And much because of the work of uh, judicial associations, and here I have to speak about my judicial association from Portugal, uh, we managed to trigger a decision from the European Court of Justice that for the first time said, uh, the organization of internally of the national judiciaries is a competence of member states, but they should not, not forget that you are in one single judiciary common area. So an attack to, an, to the independence of judges in one country affects the whole European Union. So you are free to do whatever you want, uh, organizing your national judicial systems, but you have to respect the common values in what regards the independence of the judiciary in the whole area of the European Union. So um, we are basically uh, working in two different fields. We're speaking with the, the European institutions, the European Commission, the European Parliament, the Council, trying to uh, convince them that it is urgent to act in the cases of Poland or Hungary or other cases which are not so public but also deserve our attention. But we also are very uh, interested in what the European Court of Justice is doing. Uh, and this, this, because of a simple reason, as we all know, much of the building of the European Union was uh, done by the European Court of Justice, applying the European Union law and principles to uh, areas which were not black and white in the treaties. And that's basically what's happening now. And the European Court of Justice uh, works on purely juridical fundaments, not political. They don't need unanimity to have decisions. Judges in Luxembourg apply European law principles and treaties. And uh, many times, as in this case has happened, they manage to act when politics don't have the will or the courage to do it. Uh, so yes, it's true that we as a civil society organization uh, the civil society organization are working also w with the European institutions, political institutions, but we also have a very important job uh, with the European Court of Justice. Great. Thanks a lot. Unfortunately, uh, our time is up because we have so much to cover tonight. Um, now we're going to see uh, two videos um, with a special, very, very individual call to Europe, um, which we're going to see now.
Hallo, ich heiße Jasmin Higo, ich komme aus Deutschland und arbeite im Technologiebereich. Ähm, genauer gesagt arbeite ich daran, Unternehmensbereiche und auch öffentliche Räume inklusiver zu gestalten, vor allem für People of Color. Denn wenn wir uns nicht gegen strukturellen Rassismus auch aussprechen, äh, können wir gar nicht als Gesellschaft weiterkommen. Und deswegen meine Bitte an euch. Wenn ihr rassistische Vorfälle erkennt oder sieht, bitte sagt etwas, zeigt euch solidarisch. My name is Dimitris Balas. I live and work in the Netherlands where I'm a professor of economic geography at the University of Groningen. Today, thousands of refugees are losing their lives in the Mediterranean Sea in a desperate attempt to find sanctuary in Europe. Join me in demanding the safe passage of refugees and the protection of human rights. We're now going to go straight into our second panel. And for this second panel, I would like to welcome, uh, first and foremost, the founder and secretary general of New Europeans, that organization whose birthday we are celebrating today, seven years old, um, Roger Casale. Um, I secondly would like to welcome Paul Henningsen, uh, a board member of the New Europeans, joining us from Aarhus in, in Denmark and um, uh, by profession, a communications specialist and advisor. Thirdly, I would like to welcome uh, Adelaide Hirvey. Adelaide Hirvey um, is um, the Secretary General um, of the African Union Diaspora Youth Initiative and also the founder of the ACP Young Professional Network and has worked a lot in different uh, forms of activism regarding um, race equality, regarding feminism and in various other forms, which is why we welcome her as well. Um, and final, uh, last but not least, um, I would like to welcome Aj Anjineska Weiner, uh, who is today joining us from Canada. So, um, bon appetit for lunch, I, I should say. Um, and Anjineska is a professor of European law and an expert of, uh, on, on the issue of European citizenship, which is so key to today's, uh, today's debate um, and to our organization. So, thank you very much for joining us. And again, sorry for this um, technical interruption we just had. We just re-watched the, the, the two videos and I would now like to pick up um, on these issues regarding um, equality um, and the rule of law, um, sort of the right to, to live a secure life in, in peace. Um, all these issues are very, very strongly connected to European citizenship. They are very connected to European values. And um, I would like to ask Roger, um, what his idea was when he founded New Europeans and what uh, New Europeans is doing in order to create and foster that European citizenship and that European identity. Thank you, Julius, and thank you to everybody who's joined us for our birthday celebration. And uh, as the saying goes, it's, it's our party and we'll cry if we have to. We, we had to cry a little bit because of the technical issues. But thanks for staying with us and thanks for everybody who stayed with us since we started in 2013. And the reason we started was that we realized, a group of us realized that uh, the referendum was coming in the UK and if Britain voted to leave, EU citizens would be stripped of their rights. So we, uh, we thought, and we were, we were still EU citizens. We, the Brits, were still EU citizens. So we set up a, an organization to uh, promote free movement, EU citizenship, and to say to people, you know, value what you've got. And unfortunately, Britain did vote to leave and now people realize uh, what they've got and unfortunately they realize it too late but it's too late to stop Brexit but the issue of citizens rights is still a very live one in the UK for EU citizens there and for uh, Britons in the EU and uh, more importantly to even than that in terms of our uh, discussions today um, you know learn from Brexit and uh, act now don't let it get too late and we have heard this evening some fabulous contributions about the rule of law, press freedom, racism in Europe, all kinds of issues that uh, really come down to our fundamental values, what it means to be a European, to belong to Europe. And we, um, we have to stand up for our rights and our values uh, in every time. And our time, in our time now, we have to do that as well. And we're just one of many organizations that are doing that, as I say, thank you very much for being with us. Come and join us. We have a fantastic team. Uh, it's neweuropeans.net. And there's a job to be done to save Europe. And let's get that done before it's too late. Indeed, thanks. This is another call to Europe today. Um, I'd like to hand over to Anginieska. Um, and I would like to know from her, because especially with your, with your scientific background, 
um, what can you tell us about that European identity? Are we there? When are we going to be there? How would you measure if we are actually there, if that European identity has been created? So um, how do you, as a, as a scientist, and as a law, obviously a, a law scientist um, and an expert on European citizenship, um, how do, uh, what is your take um, on this, this question of European citizenship and European identity? So I need to, well, first of all, welcome everybody. Uh, it's an honor to be here. I'm a newbie. This is the first time I participate uh, in an event of New Europeans. Do you hear me well? No, no, yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah. No, because I have to tell you uh, uh, that uh, here in Canada, I'm, I'm calling to you from uh, Ottawa. Everybody works from home, and this is actually the time we end our lunch, so internet gets very busy. Uh, so, um, I apologize for any inconvenience up front. I need to say that I'm not a law a researcher. This needs to be clarified. Uh, however, I'm, I'm the researcher of the European citizenship from the point of view of the European studies. And um, I live in Canada now, and I think that this going away from uh, Europe actually gave me a, a very interesting perspective on what it means to be European. European studies, we always say that people who engage with, uh, with Europe more, so for example, people who go to Erasmus, who are mobile throughout Europe, uh, get most stronger, I would say, a stronger European identification. And uh, we can see that, and I was really touched to hear the first panel, the words of uh, Philippe, who actually got engaged uh, with the context and the situation in my home country, uh, Poland. And I was thinking, wow, this is really something important that Europeans engage outside of their own country with the, with the valid issues in the other European countries because we actually have a community. So what I would like to say uh, and what is probably the, the most important thing on my mind now that this values um, sort of disappears when you leave Europe and Brexit is let's say only a very specific case however you have to understand that all Europeans the moment they cross European borders they lose their European citizenship you normally do not really think about it but this is uh, true because almost all the rights uh, which are enshrined in the EU passport, in the EU nationality, uh, are based on the residence in Europe. When you leave Europe for half a year, a year, 10 years, or whole life, the, these rights do not apply to you at all. And we forget about it. So for me, the pitch to, to Europe is actually we have to go back to, uh, to the table. We have to put our back to the table and maybe you can restart from there. Um, yeah, so we have to go back to the table and to, to make sure that all Europeans can carry the their rights enshrined in their citizenship, even if they reside outside Europe. So that this is what I wanted to say tonight, really. Great. Uh, thank you very much. Um, handing over to Paul, um, uh, as I said before, a communication specialist and also specialist on teamwork. And um, he always says teamwork is what we need for Europe to work. Um, because obviously a team also includes diverse members and uh, as a team of 27 states, if you like, and even more, obviously, citizens, um, how can we work together despite the differences that we have, which are obviously there culturally, 
language-wise, and in many other forms. Well, I'd like to, uh, of course, uh, welcome everybody and congratulations, Roger, to your to European birthday. Uh, I, but I'd like to connect to what Agnieszka said about going back to the table. Uh, I'll tell you a story. For many years, I worked as a freelance interpreter. That means I sat at the table in the parliament, in commission, uh, in the council. And th that's, of course, one of the reasons why I'm, I, I'm really looking at what do people say and how do they say it. And uh, today and tomorrow, uh, the heads of state and government are meeting uh, uh, online, like we do. And uh, I think it would be really interesting to hear what's their call to Europe. What do they say and how do they say it? And I hope they'll step up to the plate and talk about uh, three things. First of all, that we need to cooperate about health. So, so my vision would be the healthiest continent. That should be the vision that 27 heads of state and government should talk about yesterday. How do we do that? And then they might also have a vision of uh, how to make the most, the, the greenest continent. I think, I think you could gather European populations around that vision. And then uh, a, final a final sort of call to Europe is, I think we need a dynamic Europe, a vibrant Europe. That means that, there is, that, that we, 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 we feel that uh, we are onto something that where we, where we, and in football terms, we didn't have the European championships. Too bad, because that would have created a, a common experience for all Europeans that we, everybody loves, you know particularly football lovers, of course. But, uh, but the European champions is where nations compete. But we also have the Champions League, where every Champions League team is composed of many different nation nationalities. So we have both things in the same sort of in the same sport. So uh, my call to Europe is really that, that let's, let, let's, let's talk about health, let's talk about, about green, and la let's talk about being vi vibrant. Uh, and I'll come back uh, with other calls when, uh, Julius, you want, probably want somebody else on the screen now. <laughs> well, I can see that you are a moderator yourself. Now I'm going to hand over to uh, Adelaide. Adelaide, uh, I introduced her as the Secretary General um, of the African Union um, Youth Diaspora Initiative. Um, and also she's working as a program manager um, at the ACP um, Young Professional Network. And I can't even mention all of the different projects that he's been part of, she's been part of in the past because they are so numerous. Um, but what is clear is that you've been very, very active um, in the field, specifically regarding um, African youth diaspora, regarding equal rights, um, both regarding race and regarding um, feminism, uh, which, are, which are sort of both aspects where um, sort of the, the, um, the value of equality comes in. Um, so you are, you are very experienced uh, in these sectors. And I would like to hear from you regarding, uh, well, first of all, your call to Europe generally for this tonight's event. Um, and secondly, uh, linking back um, to what Agnieszka and, and Paul said. I think we can't hear you. Well, can I know we you? can't hear. Oh yeah, now we can. Yeah, you can, okay. Yeah. Um, I was just saying thank you and uh, for having me today and happy birthday. Um, this is a great uh, initiative really because uh, this is what we do when you have a birthday. You have candles and you make wishes and, and then most of the time it happens. So we really hope that uh, all these calls are going to be he heard. Um, and it's only great also to, to have on the panel people that have such ambitious um, hopes and, and calls for, for Europe. Um, and uh, so, yeah, on uh, racial equality, uh, which is not all that I've worked on, I've also worked with migrants, etc. Um, so it's all about, uh, I would say, equal opportunity. What people are looking for is, and I think uh, that's what Yasmin was uh, saying earlier, it's not just about racism, the visible part of it is also about the invisible part of it, so the more structural part. Um, and when you look at um, some of the data, you realize that really th there is something very deep uh, in, in, in the system, in the European system now that needs to be, that needs to be challenged. 
uh, that's what the debate yesterday at the plenary was about. Um, and it's good that it's being recognized now. It's unfortunate that someone had to die in the US for it to become a an international movement, um, but it is, it is necessary that we face it. Now, um, one of my many calls, because I, I have a long list, but uh, I think what we need to, what Europe needs to do is one, to recognize um, the, the power of diversity and to leverage on this power of diversity. There is so much opportunity that, that, that is in diversity and there are actually many researchers from uh, some of the top in the industry, in different industries also, that prove that diversity in a team brings productivity, brings efficiency. So if we take artificial intelligence, for example, it, it does not work when you don't have a diverse team because the people that you're aiming to are diverse. So it, if you're not diverse in your team, you won't reflect the people. So uh, in addition to that, I would say maybe we need data. That we should not be ashamed or shy to have data that shows the ethnic, the ethnic groups and, and the situation of the different ethnic groups because we need to have laws, we need to have responses that are based on data. But because in most European countries, we do not have this data that look at the ethnical uh, disparity between ethnic groups, we cannot have responses that, um, that target this type of issue. In the UK, you would have that, uh, and that's what we've seen, that within the, the uh, healthcare professionals, the most affected are part of the particular group, the people, uh, people of color, uh, professional, sorry, healthcare professional, of color have been more affected. They are the one that die most. And so there is a response from the government to deal with it. But if without data, we cannot move forward. So let's not be shy to look at the data, to face it. They, this is what we are all about. We cannot shy away from the reality. And my other thing is, all of this obviously links back to, um, to human rights. Europe always advocates human rights around the globe. And we cannot, Europe cannot continue to wave the human rights flag at everybody, at a partner and not partner around the world if we are not looking at the issue within our own continent. Uh, we cannot, um, so just to, to go back to, um, to that, so we, we're going to lose a part of our power to wave that human rights flag if we do not look at the issue within the continent itself. Um, and uh, yeah, so just to go back to something that was said in the previous panel, let's be on the right side of history and, and, and really, uh, uh, yeah, so let's stand on the right side of history, I would say, is, the, is, is what I'll finish on. <laughs> I don't know if I've done my five minutes, but yeah. Great. You raised an incredible amount of, of key issues to the debate. Um, I'd like to pick up on one specific one and I'd like to hand over to Anieshka and I'd like to talk about uh, this diversity that uh, Adelaide said that this actually uh, contributes to productivity and actually makes groups and teams actually better in, in achieving what they want to achieve. So uh, what are the issues regarding diversity in Europe? Where does European citizenship already go together and where sort of does it clash and, and how could this overcome? How, how could this be overcome? I'm sorry. So again, uh, I come to you from a different perspective because uh, I'm, I'm Europe outside Europe. <laughs> and honestly, uh, there is a big truth in, uh, in this statement uh, that there is no, uh, no doubt that uh, and no, uh, no doubt that the diversity is important. I see it every day in Canada here, uh, the best AI Institute is based in Montreal. And there are many diverse people who uh, actually work there. Uh, from the perspective of the European citizenship, as uh, such, it is not based on ethnic or uh, national, really, uh, considerations, right? And when we are here in Canada or uh, or in the US, and I have to say that I'm I have a, a big network uh, of my European uh, uh, kinsmen, I would say, across North America. Uh, 
it is interesting how diverse we are. You know, the whole idea that uh, that immigrants from uh, from Europe are basically white and Christian is no longer true. We have everybody uh, because Europe actually is very diverse. And uh, I talk to people who all have uh, all the colors and all the religions and they feel very much the same as I do, very European in, uh, in an uh, American context, really. So I think that we should build on this. Um, we should build on this feeling of community that is there. And especially in North America, we should do uh, a lot of work to, um, to bring these people together because looking at itself, you know, when actually Europe will look at itself in the mirror uh, across the ocean, it will see, oh, this is who I am now. And we might not really think about it every day. Thank you. <laughs> Great. Um, I think we are already moving slowly towards the end of this discussion because we still have a uh, video screening on. Um, but I'd like to take up this thought and I would like um, to ask Roger, um, do you think that Europe should take Canada as example in terms of uh, cherishing diversity and in terms of living it, as it was just described by Anieshka? Uh, I think we, we should. Um, I think we should certainly do that. And I, I think we also need to recognize um, as the constituency of Europeans outside Europe that Inesco has spoken to and develop a, understand that, um, you know, we are not just citizens of Europe, we're also global citizens and we want European citizenship to work in a global context. But let's also remember, if I may, Julius, that, you know, Agnieszka used that very nice phrase, I'm a European outside Europe. But I have to say there are a lot of people who live in Europe who feel that they are outside Europe even though they are in Europe. And this is something that we have to change as well. And that is why I'm so delighted that we have the collaboration with We Belong and we have heard the voices uh, of Jana and Yasmin and, 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 and others this evening and also the perspective from Adelaide from the incredibly important work that she does because and I remember Adelaide reminded us that we need we need to look at the numbers. We need to look at the data. We need to, it's, you know, we, we've been reminded about our values, but we also need to arm ourselves with the facts and use the facts and the data and the evidence, as Adelaide has reminded us, to inform our arguments and to develop our policies. And so I think it's been a very, very rich discussion. But yes, we need to see Europe in a global perspective, uh, and that means we need European citizens to be able to be global citizens and that's not much use if when you get to Canada you find us account for anything. We need to learn from each other and there's a tremendous amount we can learn from the experience of Canada. And we need to remember that, as Paul has said, we want, of course, we want a healthy, green, dynamic Europe in which everybody can say we belong. Wow, thanks a lot. Um, and this introduces our our round of, of final comments. And because this is a birthday party, um, usually uh, if there is a birthday, you also get a present. But for that present to arrive, you maybe also need to issue a wish. And so I would like to ask you to issue a wish. Um, and this should be very visionary. Um, and you can, you're welcome to sort of say what you think is likely to happen and what you think is maybe just pure vision. So I'll give you complete liberty. And I'm gonna start off with, with Paul. What is your, your vision regarding that European citizenship, regarding a strong, European, an active European society that actually perceives itself um, as part of that continental European community. Um, how do you think this is going to develop or how would you want it to develop in the future? Thanks a lot. I think for, 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 for things to change and get better, you need to get hold of the leaders and you need to get hold of the people. So I would like to have a choir of uh, the heads of state and government, 27 people to sing as one choir with one voice. And then I'd like to have choirs nationally and locally, because you can't, you can't uh, change Europe if you don't start locally. And, and choir is a wonderful metaphor because, you know, uh, you find out that it's fantastic to sing. 
and you find out that uh, maybe the, the 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 person next to you doesn't sing as as wonderfully as you do, but there is room for that, and uh, you know you you make the best of it. Uh, so I, I, that's my wish, you know, to get uh, European heads, heads of state government to sing as one choir, and let's do that all also nationally and uh, locally. And and the the key words we heard tonight: e equality, rule of law. I mean, the repertoire is there, but we don't understand it. We don't get it. Yeah, congratulations, Roger. Sing. <laughs> okay. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, without without any without any comment, um, I would like to go uh, to Anieshka. So, in the same vein, my the, the, the dream would be to have a festival for the European kids uh, in Canada and in the U.S. The kids that are second or third generation Europeans who have the passport but who don't understand what it means really because no one taught them to uh, and then we will see the, the diversity and the the colors of these kids and their happiness and we can share with them the dream of Europe yeah thanks a lot uh, Adelaide, I think it's fair to say that the two of us are certainly um, closest to being the kids of Europe. Uh, so yeah, you were you were just mentioned perhaps in a way, maybe uh, in a bit of a broader sense. Uh, what is your what is your vision? What is your wish? Um, so my wish, it's so long, but I will just say um, for the leadership in Europe to mirror the people in Europe, um, and for. Um, for our system to mirror what we stand for openly. So, yeah. Great. Thanks a lot. These are incredibly many calls of Europe uh, or calls to Europe today. And um, with that, I would like to hand over um, to Roger, who is going to introduce uh, the final part of the evening um, without, um, without further ado, except for thanking our audience very much, our live audience, and thanking our panelists as well for. Um, navigating with us through these stormy waters today. I think that in, despite that, the conversations were great and the conversation was recorded on Facebook and you can watch it live. We're gonna cut it and there is gonna be a nice and polished version for all of those uh, who didn't really uh, catch a certain part or who maybe um, also jumped off because they thought, okay, this is not gonna work out. It is actually working out. We, we made the proof. And um, thank, you, thank you very much for joining us. Um, happy birthday, new Europeans. And uh, yeah, Roger, the founder, the floor is yours. Well, thank you, Julius, uh, for, uh, for moderating and for all you did with our team to prepare this uh, birthday celebration. And thank you to our panelists for turning up and for uh, telling us your calls to Europe, calls to Europe, which uh, those uh, who are watching should know we will also be producing on video, each Call to Europe on video, short video with a short blog, and we will be putting that out over the next two weeks, the, the, the Call to Video. And if you're watching and you'd like to make your Call to Europe, you'd like to make a short video or a blog, and make sure that your voice is heard, please get in touch. Uh, write to us at bureau, B-U-R-E-A-U, at neweuropeans.net. Uh, join New Europeans, join us, join on one of our teams, join as a member, join as a volunteer, uh, help us because there's a job to be done and you've seen this evening the problems we had just on a technical level and sometimes we, 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 we grapple with linguistic issues but there's nothing that we can't deal with if we work together as a team and we are a team and we have uh, uh, a job to do, uh, come and help us. Uh, those issues are nothing compared to the barriers that still need to be brought down, the borders in the mines, the, the discrimination and the fear that holds people back from fulfilling their, their full potential in Europe. And I, I would just say this, Julius, in, in concluding, and then I will say a word about what happens next. Um, we are in the depth of a, of a very big crisis. And it's also an opportunity for change. And I hope that when we do come out of the crisis, that if everything has stayed the same, there's a famous Italian expression from literature that everything has to change for everything to stay the same. I, I hope that everything doesn't stay the same. I hope that, you know, who is an insider, who is an outsider today, that's got to change. 
that's got to change. Who's got power, who hasn't got power today, that has to change. Who's at the top, who's at the bottom, these things need to change. They really need to change. And I think there's an opportunity to do that and we want to be a part of that. And I think it's going to come about because of us, because of we the citizens, not because of some figure like de Gaulle or anybody else, but because we stand up for what we believe and what we want and we make our voices heard and we want to be a part of that. And that's why it, it, it's going to happen, that things really are really, really going to change. We're going to take Europe to a new level, which is going to be much more inclusive, where everybody can say, we belong. So that concludes, as you said, Julius, our, this part of the birthday party, which is to do with our work in, uh, in Europe. Let's remember Europe is much more than the EU. There's uh, Ukraine, we heard from Olivier in, the, in Ukraine, Balkans, uh, uh, the UK. The second part of the show is actually going to start in one hour's time. We're going to finish this at uh, eight o'clock, European, uh, Central European Summer Time. And the next part of the show will actually start at nine o'clock. And that will focus on the work that New Europeans is doing in the UK. I look back over the last seven years, but of course now we're based in Brussels and we work across Europe. Uh, and indeed, uh, internationally. Fantastic to have Agnieszka here from New Europeans North America. And it'll be a half hour show where we hear from some of the wonderful team members we have in London, working with EU citizens in, in London. And we hear from uh, the wonderful people, the wonderful work that's going on uh, to campaign for the rights of citizens in the UK. And also let's remember the, 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 the British people who live uh, in, the, in the EU who also need their rights protected. So that's a, that's a short half hour show that will be on from nine o'clock to Central European Summer Time. So I hope you tune in then again. Uh, thank you for being with us on our birthday. Thank you for listening to our call for Europe. And we look forward to hearing your call for Europe. Come and join us, come and join the movement. Let's change Europe together. Thank you very much. <laughs>